Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Today's podcast, we're going to talk about the state of computer automation and the future of humanity. Yeah, it's a great topic. Let's do that. Hey, everyone. It's Joe Glines here out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie is still here from Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, so today's topic is kind of big, the state of computer automation and the future of humanity. Um, AI is making some really huge you know, progress in being able to do stuff that's it's quite amazing. Um, we have a couple examples here. I'll put the links in the uh, description of whether you're listening to this or, or it's a video or whatever. But um, there was one example I saw recently on a, on a brain implant on a paralyzed man allowing him to, quote, unquote, speak. You know, it's typed out on the screen. But he can reply to people with full sentences. Um, and it's not, well, from what we could tell, it's, oh, it's actually sensing. It was a sensor in the middle of his brain. And uh, it was just, you know, it didn't seem like he was typing in letters. You no. Know? So it was actually picking up the words it looked like, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually quite amazing, I, I would say. It, the idea of being able to do stuff from brain implants I, I recently saw, I, I know I talked to you about that, the, I, the Neuralink or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but it was a sub um, city of uh, one of the Tesla companies. I don't remember which one it was, but apparently they were a big backer of, of that piece of software or piece of hardware um, that would allow you to much, much more easily have um, something like this guy had instead of having big brain like surgery to get this stuff uh, it would be a minor um, thing that was under the skin and not actually on the brain so that was interesting yeah i was going to look on amazon and see if they had any that i could order um, <laughs> maybe not yet uh the next one, which was to me, because I know you were the one that introduced me, Jackie, to, to Pat Flynn, um, but he, he showed the Descript uh, editor, and it, the video starts off where he's he type, he doesn't talk at all. He just types something, and what he types is something like, wouldn't it be amazing if the computer could speak what I'm typing in my voice? And then he compiles it, and within, you know, at least in the video, a couple of seconds, hits play, and it really sounded like him, even his cadence and everything. And that was a, uh, holy crap, that's that's creepy. Yeah, we, we didn't hear much from him about how long it had taken him to, to train it or anything, but from how he presented it, it seemed as if it had been a piece of cake to actually make it do that. It, it didn't seem like he had used a lot of time and effort on actually teaching the computer uh, to speak his voice yeah, so I, yeah yeah it was quite amazing i do recall when i watched i watched the entire video a while ago and uh he said you know the the computer has to have access to a lot of your speaking right so it it, it could be older stuff that you've done as well but it does have to have access to it but it doesn't mean that you're sitting here recording it specifically you can feed it other stuff but uh, anyway there was that. There's the co-pilot from GitHub, which is really cool as well. And now it's it's not in auto hockey yet, but um, other thing, I think Python had, had it, and maybe some of the other you know big languages. But it is assisting you in developing your code. And uh, Geek Dude, I think, actually had tried it, and he had replied to me and said, "Yeah, we don't have to worry about our jobs yet, but um, but it is a really big help." Yeah, that's amazing. It it. It's interesting because it's one of the fields where they're talking quite a lot about this, um, not having to know how to program to be able to program, which is kind of a weird concept and not the first field one would expect that to be a thing in. But fair enough, programming is a lot of text and rules so it might be a little easier to teach um, a computer how to do compared to some of the other more uh, outside world these things. So, yeah. Yeah, and to that point, Jackie, um, this wasn't in our list of stuff, 
But uh, last week, just offhanded, I, I can't remember if it was actually, it was right at the very last second you and I were talking. Um, and I mentioned the whole trying to create uh, a couple apps for, for this restaurant I'm helping. And, and I'm like, well, I didn't really want to pay to create a, an, an iPhone app and an uh, Android app and blah, blah, blah. And you mentioned AppSheet. And, um, and I started looking into it, and it's, you know, it's a no-code way to develop apps. Um, and I don't love their pricing uh, overall, I mean, what's great is if it's a small business and you have less than 10 people, then it's still free, right? Basically for you guys. But, um, it was pretty neat. I, in, in like 20 minutes, I didn't even watch any videos or anything. I just said, screw it. I'm going to create an account and see what I can do. And in 20 minutes, I created an app that would run on an iPhone or Android or in a desktop browser. Um, and I, I was able to, you know, have it where it would pull up the address book of people and text them or, you know, write an email or even do a mail merge. Um, with with their names and stuff it was very very impressive um and again no code which is mind-blowing that you can do something like that right and it, this is why i want to save that topic um to go deeper in because i think it's a great one that, that we should do both podcasts and probably a webinar on because the when you break down how phones you know change Compare, you don't have to have a laptop or a computer, right? And suddenly you don't have to have print. So anyway, it'll be a really fun discussion. Um, and now the, the last one, I think it's just like uh, how we're using uh, Alexa and the Google Assistant, right? And we're kind of, this is where I know you and I have talked about it. I know you've, you've started using it and your kids have used it and my son's been using it for a long time. And it's really fascinating because I know when I first started using it, this is quite a while ago. We used to have a lot. We still have a lot, but just have a smaller house. Um, that I had to think cautiously ahead of time before I asked it something. And it took me a couple of times to really get my thought process straight because I was listening to um, um, audio, um, what are they called? Ebooks or something? No, it was a playlist because I, I wanted a certain yeah. order to it. And, <laughs> and so I had to say the artist, the playlist, and this, and it, and it took me on. But now it's like my brain has been trained where it's, I kind of think that way. I don't have to struggle to remember how to say the stuff, the order and what to say. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I've kind of become so used to it now that it's ingrained in, in me and it's so much easier to use. Um, and this is where I think it's a good thing to start saying like, okay, is, is that a good thing? <laughs> right. Is it a bad thing? Um, I don't see how it could be a problem. And in a lot of ways, I think compared to, you know, 20 years ago, we humans have gotten away from learning how to like form an argument and, and logic and really, you know, get good at it. And now we're very undisciplined. So having structure to where you have to think about how you say things and do things in a certain way, that's, that's not a, to me a bad thing. No, I, I, most technology to me is, is very, Open ended, it, it finding it good or bad. It's it's very very hard to to pin down being one or the other. Um, I just set up my daughter's new uh, tablet here yesterday, and um, she didn't have a Gmail account, and it asked if she were was a child, and I was like, yeah, she's a child. Okay, how? what's her birthday and stuff like that. Typed it in and it was very clear that I could do quite a lot of things as the parent controlling the device. Mm -hmm. I'd say I haven't put on much um, limitation because she has had an unlimited device for quite a few years already. So there was no reason to start limiting her because she has already learned quite a lot of how to behave with the things. But yeah, it was interesting. But again, how much do I want to play big brother, so to speak? Um, do I actually want to follow along and be able to see whatever she's messaging or whatever videos she's seeing? I don't really have the time to keep a close eye on that. As long as I can go to her and see what she's watching and she's open about whatever she's doing, I don't have a problem with it. And a colleague of mine, he said the same thing at work with a different thing. And that was being followed by, I don't know, the government or whatever it might be. 
there's some things that's okay to be watched. And uh, I had another colleague who had a kid that was threatened on his life online. And sadly, the case ended with the police not really being able to do much because the company that owned the chat server that they were using wasn't willing to share any type of IP or any other information about the user in this case. And thereby, even the police actually ended up saying, yeah, it's not a case where we can use um, the needed leverage to move or sway this company to do it. Had it been, um, let's say, an actual physical uh, offense, it might have been another case. But in this one, mm, not really. And that to me is a little sad because nobody should be allowed to threaten other people on their life. I don't care if it's in a digital format or chat or whatever. To me, it's something that just shouldn't be allowed. People can have arguments and they can disagree and they can do all kinds of things. They can even name call to whatever degree they want to do that. But actually threatening people on their life. And I know where it, this guy, this, this, this was a child who, of course, didn't have the needed filter to maybe understand the limitations of what was being said. So he believed that the person on the other end actually knew where he lived, who he was, which route he took to school and stuff like that. So he became truly afraid. And to me, that's, that's one of the places where I'm like, yeah, maybe it's okay if, if law enforcement or whatever, as long as it's still due process and all that stuff can be allowed to watch that stuff because the digital world has moved very quickly yeah. and the politician and law and stuff like that hasn't been able to follow along. You yeah. can do amazing things on a computer with code and whatnot. Um, and we don't really have all the needed laws and digital systems and all that stuff to cover all of what we are now experiencing or living. So, yeah, yeah. I know that was long winded, but yeah, I ended up saying something at least. Yeah. Technology is, you know, there's, there's pros and cons, no matter what you're looking at, right? To me, there's always pros and cons. Um, now, now the other one though, I would say is like, like for me and I, Actually, I, I don't. I don't know if we've talked much about this. I, I live by my calendar, right? Like I put everything in my calendar. If I want something to get done, I put it in my calendar because I can't. I just. It's not that I can't remember. It's that I don't want to have to try to remember, right? So I trust mm -hmm. the thing to remind me of things, and then it frees me up. And that's where I think some. I know there's proof. You know, there's evidence that shows it's a. You know, your brain is like a use it or lose it, and if if I by not using you know, my brain to keep track of time and events. Um, I'm probably really suck at it now if suddenly phones went away and I didn't have a uh, a phone with a smartphone with a, a way to see my calendar and it remind me. But um, at the same time, I love it because it frees me up to really focus on everything else and not have to try to remember all these minute details, right, which is crazy. We've, we've talked about different parts of this at length and, and one of the things is um, expecting things to go away is probably not viable or whatever you'd call that it i know that the human race have had ups and downs throughout history and we we only have 40 50 60 100 years of experience um but still, I do hope that this time around, we're not going to do something very weird and kill or whatever half of us and have some kind of apocalypse where all technologies or 
science advantage or whatever it is goes away. So you not having to remember your appointments or in my case, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is I can still remember my um, childhood phone number from from my uh, parents' house because I needed it. My friends needed to know it if they wanted to reach me and stuff like that. But I haven't used it for 30 years, right? But still, it's there. But now I can I can remember my wife's phone number, but my kids, yeah, I, I, I can't because I've never really had to. They've always just been on my phone. And it's the same with newer friends, colleagues. I I wouldn't be able to, I don't know, have a breakdown in the car and having to borrow someone's phone. Right. Uh, I wouldn't be able to call more than a handful of people. That That's about the phone numbers I still remember. Um, and the rest of them are just remembered for me. If I need to call this guy up, I'll find him in my contacts and do that. And as you said yourself, maybe we use the ability or we lose the ability to then remember eight, 10, 12 digit numbers or whatever it is. Maybe we won't ever need to remember that. Right. Who knows that it might be a thing of the past now. Well, and yeah, and, and I have another, we have another, um, topic that at some point we'll cover of the whole learn it now versus you know learn a little bit now and then use youtube or google or whatever it is to to learn what you need to know in the moment um and it's it's that's a whole discussion there but it it really is interesting how things have changed and <clears throat> there's no way you can learn everything you need to know now right and that's where it gets back to 20 30 years ago life was much simpler right so I think it made a lot yeah. more sense to, and things didn't change as fast. So it made a lot more sense to not to, to go ahead and remember all these things. Um, now with things changing so fast and everything, I don't think we have the capacity uh, to keep up with things as much as we used to. No, I, I just a few examples, but one of the things that we talked about uh, some time ago was I think it was Facebook, the Melinda, not, no, it was, um, yeah, the owner of Facebook and his wife or whatever, they have a foundation just like Bill Gates and Melinda Gates had or have. Um, and one of the things they wanted to use money on was making a system to keep track of all, um, uh, what was it? biochemical um, research papers, something like that. That's just one of the, the ones I remember. They wanted to make a tool that would make it easier and simpler for scientists in a specific field to keep on top of whatever had uh, come out of new research. And in that news article, um, one of the things they pointed out was that in bioengineering, 80,000 papers are released weekly around the globe. So, so whoever you are, you will never know everything that went on last week in your field. It's just not possible. Uh, Half of those might never be peer reviewed and might not need to have you actually look at. And the next half of those that are left might not really be interested, but still, you might still end up actually having a thousand papers or reports or whatever uh, they call them um, that might have something to do with the specific thing that you're working on. So because we're, just shy of 8 billion people, we're, we're getting a lot of stuff done and actually being able to grasp all of that. We, we might actually need something like uh, AI. 
Right. Yeah. We, we, there's no way we could keep up with that. So let's leverage computers to help categorize, analyze, and filter, you know, what we end up looking at and make it simple to search and find, you know, relevant things. Um, but yeah. yeah. I, I'd say one of the things where I'm currently a little irritated is with the Facebook marketplace. And that's because it again uses one of Facebook's many algorithms to try and give you the things it believes you want to see or whatever things people have paid money to get sponsored or up in searches or whatever. One thing that for sure, it's not giving you all the newest items in your area if you ask for it. And that's where I'm kind of irritated. That's when the algorithm does something that I'm not asking it to do. It It's trying to, sure. whatever it's trying to do, I don't know. Uh, for some reason, if I say, I want to get the newest posts within a 10 mile area, whatever. I want to get the closest ones first and the newest ones, because those are the two filtering options I used. But if I do it again in an hour, I'll get a few other posts in there and it will say, this was posted nine hours ago or whatever. Why didn't I get it the first time I looked? And my only reasoning behind something like that would be the algorithm actually yeah with holding that information for whatever reason. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, I think, a, a compliment to that. I'll see stuff on YouTube, because every morning I, I spend a good hour, hour and a half watching YouTube, just learning different things. And some videos will come up in my feed, and for the love of God, I'm like, I, I have no interest in watching that. But there's no way for me to actually say, hide it. Like, you know, I want to tell YouTube you missed the bucket, you know, the boat here, man. Like, I, I don't want to ever watch this one. I almost started to watch it just so it would get out of the queue that keeps, because it keeps coming up over and over. And I'm like, I'm, I don't have any interest in that thing. But I think I almost have to play it just to get it to stop being shown. Because I'm like, whatever, you know. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I had the same thing or a similar thing with Facebook where after scrolling the page a few times, it came up and said, would you be interested in seeing more of this, um, kitchen aid type stuff? And I could say uh, yes or no or X or Y or whatever. Um, and, and I, I started saying, no, I don't want to see that. No, I want to, don't want to see that. And then I stopped because it had four more. It wanted to ask me. It showed how many it had. I was like, I might want to know that next week or the week after. So right now they're trying to narrow down what I want to see or try and give me exactly items that are more interesting to me. But I'm answering the questions from a here and now. Right now, I'm not looking for roller skates for my kids. Or right now, I don't want to see more mirrors up for grabs or whatever it might be. But in two weeks, it might be the only thing I'm looking for. And I don't always want to search a specific word. Sure enough, if I'm looking for a mirror, yeah. But I might actually just want to watch decorating items. Who knows? And I don't want them to remove all the mirrors from that just because I said that for 50 whatever days ago, right? It, it's To me, it's like it's taking some choices uh, or deciding some stuff for me for a period of time that I don't know, I don't have access to any kind of settings where I can take my choice back. I don't have any kind of say after that. It's like, oh, he didn't like watching kids' clothes. So from now on out, we'll never show him more kids' clothes. Like, 
You know, that's not what I wanted to do. When, when I was at TI, um, the guy in charge of keeping TI.com up and running, um, he gave a presentation and he was talking about how like his niece or something at some point on Amazon had looked at a Barbie doll. And then he would kept going back to Amazon. And they kept showing him Barbie dolls. And he's like, I don't have an interest, but he saw that Amazon allows you to go in and remove stuff from your browsing history to help kind of negate this, right? And it's again, they're of course on the cutting edge, the the leaders um, in this this field. Um, but it was a really good point of like that's, you know, let people kind of be able to choose what they you know have shared and in what people can see. And that was one which um someone mentioned because we we have another topic actually probably our next one uh, is the. Windows 365, the Windows in the Cloud, pros and cons of it. But um, when Isaiah and I had a quick call on this when it first came out of the Windows in the Cloud, and we discussed a bit about privacy and who owns the data. And then someone commented on the 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 video, like, well, oh, there's all these policies from Microsoft, whoever, then this and this and this. And I'm like, you know, and I said, you know, I don't know you from Boo. I didn't know that recognize the, the viewer. But I'm like, I don't, even if I had, I'm like, I don't trust what they say. I don't trust, you know, Microsoft or Amazon or any of these guys to actually truly do what they say they're going to do with the data. I just, no matter what you tell me, I'm just not going to believe it. Yeah, it's one of the hard parts of this last year of um, Corona information and all that stuff is I've at least a few people on my Facebook feed and, and a few in my immediate circle that some are of the exact conviction as me and others have varying degrees of opinions about all the different information. But still, I think we talked about this recently. People who have one sided opinions about it often end up in a loop on these uh, social where the AI is controlling it and sending them more and more of that information because that's what they interact with. And again, it's kind of AI in a black box. It's doing some stuff. It's trying to please you because it's in the best interest of the company that has the platform. They want to keep you on the platform. They don't as much want to inform you correctly as much as they actually want to keep you around so they can push more ads on you or whatever it is. They yeah. Do you recall the special that you told me about on Netflix um, with the, the, the one on clicking and how they're trying to, you know, the AI stuff. Do you remember the name of that one? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to make me guess or what? Do you know the name? I, I, I recall the actual documentary, yep. but I don't recall the exact name. Right, we'll figure it out. We'll put it in here. Cause it's a great, it was a, it was a phenomenal um, show. I, I really loved it. And some of what you're describing yeah. there was really interesting too. It's like, they put stuff that's either can get a positive or the, the likelihood of you either you know commenting or liking or hating, like that's what it does automatically, right? And it's it's kind of a scary thing. Um, where I was going to go slightly, because I don't want us to get way off on politics, but um, it's fascinating to me. There's this whole discussion, which, which is fits for this one, of should AI really be deciding what we see, right? And you and I have talked a lot about that. Um, and it, it's, yeah. it's scary at the same time. But where I wanted to, to briefly go is recently with some things like on the 2020 election or around COVID or whatever, you know, at least here in the States, the government is dictating, you know, to Facebook what to share and not share and what to show and what to emphasize. And, you know, I'm not sure which I'm more afraid of, honestly. Um, it, both are bad, uh, in my opinion. I'd, I'd rather have it just open, you know, not someone i don't like honestly i'd take the ai over the, the people whoever's in power don't get me wrong it's either side i don't want either side to be have that kind of control and say oh hide those kind of things and, and reemphasize these and we're going to make people kind of have this feeling that 
oh, this is true. This is reality because look at it's social. Everyone's out here is doing this. Well, that's a fake view. Yeah. If if let's say the 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 AI or the systems that are carrying the AI or whatever um, were truly unbiased, if if there hadn't been an agenda when you built it, so whichever company, whichever programmers, whatever, um, the people that paid them probably had some kind of task they wanted to code to solve. And that's what they did. Why shouldn't they do whatever the customer asked for? And so I'm I'm very hard pressed at believing that most of the AI we have access to now is unbiased when you put it in a social media, when you put it in a search engine, when you do all these types of, types of things. If you do some deep learning yourself, uh, we turn some great auto hotkey guides on doing stuff like that. You'll see that the code per se, the algorithm per se, isn't weighted in any type of other way than what the data gives it. But we wouldn't have any way to determine from sitting at the user point of view if that was truly the case with how Google is presenting the results on whatever, uh, sugar and food. Who knows? Right. It, it might have, a, there might be a few options on the server uh, with um, a Google technician where they can actually weight it specifically to give you stuff that might sway you in one way or another. We don't have any way to know. We expect the Google search to give us 1 million results and probably the 10 first one on the first page, that's that's probably the information we are going to digest in some way or another. But is it actually the information on page 1000 that's correct or the one on page 10,000? Nobody actually gets that far. Because, oh, that's, that's usually not the case. Because when we go to page two or three, we kind of see sites where we're like, nah, that's not even the topic I was talking about, stuff like that. But more or more than not, you, if you ask anybody who does SEO or anything for web pages, if you're not on the first page on the search that people make, the traffic is not going to go to you. People just don't go beyond the first 10 results. They'll be more, much more likely to do a new search than they are actually clicking the next button. And again, so why wouldn't Google optimize their search engine for those 10 results? It, it just makes better sense. That's why when you look at page three or five or something like that, that right. it's truly up in the air because that's not where their focus is. It's on the first page because that's where people are looking. And if they have made an AI system behind the scenes that tries to give people the best results on the first page, it will wait in and do that as best it can. And whatever types of weights they used to get it to do that. That's where we're in the dark, right? I mean, a lot of the systems are this way. Awesome. Yeah, and, and getting back also to us uh, being like programmers, do we have to worry that AI is taking over? Um, I know you, you and I have talked about this a lot on different times. And, and yeah, it's it's definitely going to be taking more and more you know, jobs overall, but they're the lower end jobs are not the higher end. And hopefully it frees up people to focus on the, you know, things that humans are good at. I'd, I'd say sure enough, um, you will be sitting there having your pretty highly educated job uh, with a good fair amount of job security. 
And you have an assistant as well. She has maybe half the education that you have, and she's very good. She has quite a few years of experience. Next year, you don't need her because there is a program that could do the exact same research that she does. Stuff like that. That's something that we might have happen. It might also be the colleague in the office uh, just down the hall that, that disappears because she was old. She went on pension. But the company doesn't need to hire anybody new for that position because now we have that Microsoft system and it's actually much better at collecting all of the bills, whatever it is. Right? It, stuff like that will be how we see it most, I think, is that we'll slowly be getting programs and they'll be extended and have more and more functionality and a few or most or whatever, I, I can't really predict that, will not see it at first. It, was the um, the Netflix special, The Social Dilemma? Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds right, yeah. yeah okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll put the link in the thing. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a never-ending you know, chapter on technology and, and humans over time start using technology, you know, to, to be more efficient, right? And it's been happening for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, it's going to continue to keep on happening and we shouldn't be too afraid of it. But uh, yeah, it's still going to be... I don't, I don't think we need to be actually afraid of it. That That's my biggest take on it. I don't see any reason to be afraid of it. Um, of course, if you're afraid of using losing, I don't know perceived rights of some kind of perceived freedoms of some kind or if you don't want the government or whoever a company to be able to push their agenda on you with misinformation sure you can be very or you can worry about those things but in general i don't see it as being bad for humanity and so I think actually to, to sum up this and, and roll up on it is uh, I would have totally agree with what you said. I, I think I, I am more afraid of people in power misusing technology and doing bad with it than the technology itself being innately bad and, and scary. So, yeah, I think it's a great way to yeah. summarize the end of it there. So awesome. Great chat. Bye. Yeah. Bye.